Whether you're a regular sim racer trying out a new discipline, or a rally fan looking to take to the virtual stages for the first time, the learning curve for EA Sports WRC will be steep. To help with this, we at Traction have put our heads together and come up with a set of tips and tricks that should make life that little bit easier for you. In this first video, we will help you set up the game optimally, from force feedback settings to graphics advice, and then cover a whole host of driving techniques and tips to help you make the most of your rallying experience. We'll also be covering full-blown strategy and career mode advice in the second part, so do keep an eye out for that one on the Traction channel in the near future. Seeing as there's so much to get through, I'm going to stop rambling and get started. Getting your game and controls set up correctly is the first important step, even if it's the most boring. So here are 6 tips to get you on your feet. Like in any game, it's worth sorting your button assignments from the get-go. Regular driving controls are of course key, but unlike many other racing games, you will need to assign a button as your handbrake. If you're using a wheel, I recommend choosing a button that sits close to your thumb, and if you have an external shifter instead of using paddles, make sure the handbrake button requires the opposite hand from the shifter. You will also need to assign buttons for pause, changing camera, headlights, look behind, and quick repair. If you have limited buttons to work with, don't bother assigning a wiper button or car reset. You can set your wipers to operate automatically, and you can reset your car by pausing the game and selecting the option from the pause menu. With this kind of game on PC, which is the platform we're using for these tips and tricks, we strongly recommend prioritising performance over quality when it comes to the graphics. The best way to test this is to turn on a frames per second overlay and reduce your graphics until you can hit at least a consistent 60 FPS. We recommend turning down the anti-aliasing quality setting first, as this has a big impact on performance. Turn off V-Sync if you aren't capturing videos, and use the DLSS upscaler set to ultra performance. Don't worry too much about an isotropic filtering, as this doesn't affect the frame rate massively. Your next step is to head to the advanced graphics page and turn down your preset if you're still struggling. Even though the game won't look as pretty, I can guarantee the experience will be more enjoyable if the performance is steady. As for console, it actually runs surprisingly well relative to the PC version, and you can check out our graphics comparison video right here. Next up, if you're using a wheel, set your rotation in your wheelbase profiler outside of the game to 540 degrees, if possible with your wheel. This will make your real wheel match the one in the game. Then, once you're back in the game, leave your steering linearity set to zero, and try these force feedback settings that you can now see on the screen. For context, I was using the Fanatec DD Pro wheelbase with the boost kit, so I was getting around about 8 Newton meters of torque, and I found the most important force feedback setting was the tire friction setting, because, quite honestly, Honestly, it feels horrible on the default 100. I'd recommend lowering it dramatically or turning it off entirely. On a controller, we found the default settings to be actually pretty good, so feel free to experiment and find any subtle changes that work for you personally. The next tip is to spend some time finding your perfect personal AI difficulty level. In quick play mode, do a single stage at an AI level you think might be close to your own level. Once you've completed a fully clean stage with no major mistakes at a decent pace by your own standards, take a look at how you stack up against the AI. For me personally, I find the game far more enjoyable if a clean mistake-free run at a decent pace is needed in order to win the stage and or the event. I recommend narrowing down your AI window until a good run on a short stage can see you win it by around 2 to 5 seconds. Once you find your level, that first career mode win will feel even sweeter. Or you can just make them really slow and win by miles. It's entirely up to you. It's also worth finding your ideal driving view, depending on whether you're playing with a wheel or a controller. If you're using a wheel, simply avoid the onboard angle that shows the wheel in the game. It doesn't match up one-to-one -one with your own inputs, and it's highly off-putting. We recommend the dashboard cam for a mixture of immersion and decent visibility. Using a controller, however, use whichever camera you like. The steering wheel view works far better with a controller, as it's designed to make things look a bit smoother. Continuing the theme of camera options, many people in our preview videos asked about whether you can move the seat, and the short answer is yes and no. It appears initially like you can only adjust the seat from the cockpit view that includes the steering wheel, so for wheel users, this is a bit annoying. However, you can always adjust the FOV. We would recommend adjusting the seat height if you're going to be using this particular camera angle, as you can see far more from a slightly higher seating position, yet it will still feel realistic and immersive. Just pretend you're Marcus Gronholm height rather than Sebastian Loeb. You will need to assign buttons temporarily in order to move the seat position, and you have to be stationary in the car during a stage. Also, bear in mind that you will have to do these movements for each individual car you drive, and lower cars like the BMW M1, for example, have less headroom to work with. A nice realistic touch. Once you've moved the seat for any particular car, it will remember this position the next time you drive that car, so it makes it worth your time. 
Right then, on to the driving. The first important tip is to utilise the game's driving assists. Don't be afraid to use them, especially when you're learning. I've tried the game on a wheel and a controller with full assist turned on, and I have to say I was pleasantly surprised with how it felt. They don't drive the car for you, they just help you keep on track whilst you grasp all the other bits. Then, once you gain confidence and experience, you can begin to wind them down. If you turn it all off too early, a rear-wheel drive car is going to cause more frustration than enjoyment. But, once you are ready to start winding them down, I recommend turning off the off-throttle braking and throttle limiter, and then start gradually reducing the rest, ABS being the last assist to fully remove. And for transmission, I recommend starting in automatic until you're comfortable with hundreds of quick gear changes throughout a stage. If you have to think about it too much early doors, it will take up too much of your brain and you will miss crucial pace notes. An important tip is to ensure that you know what car it is you're driving. By that, I mean whether it's rear-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, or four-wheel drive. When you select your car, the little graphic on the bottom right of the screen will tell you the car's drivetrain layout, illuminating the wheels that are powered by the engine, and also showing you whether the engine is in the front, middle, or rear of the car. This is all important information, as it will affect how the car handles and how you have to drive it. Let's give you a demonstration using three different Fords from the late 80s and early 90s. They may be a similar age, and they may even look similar to you, but they are vastly different to drive. Older rear-wheel drive cars like to slide more and give you something called oversteer, which is when the rear steps out and you spin. Be more gentle on the throttle when leaving a corner to try and prevent this from happening. Front-wheel drive gives you the opposite of oversteer, understeer. So with front-wheel drive, although you might not spin, you will need to be more careful going into and out of the corners to avoid sliding wide and crashing into something that's on the outside of a corner. These are the easiest cars to learn driving in, but because the front wheels are driving and steering, you have to be gentle with them on corner exit to turn better. Four-wheel drive cars give you the most grip on loose surfaces like gravel. They are difficult to spin and give you the most stability and performance, so you can push a bit harder, hence why modern WRC cars are all four-wheel drive. As a rally fan, you probably know all about using the handbrake. The key here, though, is not to overdo it. It's very easy to abuse the handbrake. It's all about timing and finesse. It should be used briefly as a tool to rotate the rear of the car heading into a tight corner. Use it lightly, a quick pull or press, and as soon as you have that rotation, you can focus on maximising your exit. It's all too easy to start using it around every slow corner, holding it down for too long and throwing away vital seconds, but more often than not, it's actually faster to avoid using it entirely unless the hairpin in question is acute. My next tip is to pay attention to surface types. It's crucial to understand the grip changes between snow, gravel, ice, dry tarmac and wet tarmac. Dry tarmac gives you the most grip. Rain lowers the grip, just like in real life. Gravel and dirt give you far less grip, although weirdly, snow and ice will actually give you lots of grip due to the bespoke snow tyres and their spikes used on the Swedish and Scandia rallies. But of course, if you come across ice and snow on a tarmac rally such as Monte Carlo, be very, very cautious as you only have tarmac and general winter tyres. Also, be careful when the surface transitions during a stage. Drive slower when you reach gravel or ice, having been on tarmac. And equally, just because you're going from gravel to tarmac doesn't mean you should suddenly treat it like a tarmac rally. Those gravel tyres you have on won't work as well as you might think. Different surfaces also require different driving techniques. When you're on dirt, you can use the lack of grip to slide the car around a lot more. The key is to use the weight of the car to help you dance from corner to corner. Swinging the car from one side to the other before entering a corner is known as a Scandinavian flick and is a popular technique used in rallying to transfer that weight efficiently. Aggressive driving on these loose surfaces can work well if done properly. Tarmac, on the other hand, requires an entirely different driving technique. Here, it's about being smooth with your inputs and maximising the space available to you whilst limiting unnecessary sliding. This allows you to keep your momentum up like you would in circuit racing and maximise your corner exit speed. Having two very different driving techniques in your locker will help your versatility massively. It's why the likes of Sebastian Loeb could beat both the flying Scandinavian gravel experts and the European tarmac specialists over numerous WRC seasons. Of course, rallying isn't just about flat-out driving speed. An important skill to master is the ability to evaluate the risk at any given moment and drive accordingly. It's not just about the surface, for example, it's about the surroundings. Let me give you an example. If you are driving through the forests of Yavaskula, Finland, and pushing flat out, any mistake could result in a Colin McRae level of shunt, and your rally could be over. Then, take Sardinia. There are wide open sections that allow you to push the limits and get away with it. Bushes aren't going to hurt you as much as trees and rocks at the end of the day. So in these scenarios, you can actually afford to take more risk. Evaluate your surroundings and drive accordingly. The final tip for this video is arguably the most important of the law. So important, in fact, that we have an entire video dedicated to the subject coming very soon. It is, of course, your co-driver. 
Their pace notes give you crucial information about the road ahead, and our guide will help you understand every single pace note in EA Sports WRC. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to catch that video as it's released. But I'll give you the brief summary now anyway. It's incredibly important to listen carefully to the instructions given by your co-driver. I'd recommend picking the language that you understand the clearest in high-intensity situations, lowering the volume level of every element except for the co-driver calls, and also make sure the co-driver call distance is set to the earliest setting. All of these things will help you focus on the notes and keep your car on the road. And that's going to conclude part one of our EA Sports WRC tips and tricks. Hopefully you found this useful, and if you did, why not leave us a like? And let us know down in the comments below what you are thinking of the game so far. Subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss part two, where we will cover everything strategy related, from car and tyre compound selection to career mode and setup tips. Also, as I just mentioned, a full comprehensive co-driver guide for this game is on its way too, so make sure you don't miss out on that if you want to learn a new language. That's it from us, so until next time, thanks for watching, keep it pinned, and have a great day.